So if you think about economy as, a, as a, this big circle, okay, so this is, this is economy. And in this economy, we have certain institutions. So for example, in economy, we have banking and finance, banks, we have institutions like health, Okay, what else we have in, you know, we have uh, education, we have uh, media, let's say, media entertainment. Okay, everybody needs this, especially these days, yes. What else we have in economy? We have uh, hmm? retail, so, so we have some sort of a, uh, trade, trade where people buy and sell stuff. Um, nothing comes in my mind. We have, let's say, defense. We have defense, we, did we say technology? We have tech, okay? Anything that you can think of from the health, from the uh, uh, media, from anything that, that you think in terms of industry, in economy, this is represented by this line. Could be hundreds of these different lines. In order to analyze how this work, in terms of the money, movement, and so on, we separate people, participants, by purchasing power. So at the bottom, we have people who have nothing. They have no money, okay? And actually below them, there are people who, ha who are in debt. They are in minus, okay? So they, they, are, they are here. They are outside of economy totally. On the next level, we have people who have, let's say, a bit more money, okay? The next level up, we have people who have, again, more money, and so on. People who have even more money, okay? Obviously, more money you have, more you can engage uh, economy and institutions that are within this economy. So let's say somebody with a lot of wealth, they can buy the best education, okay? They can buy best uh, health, okay? They can have a best technology. Person with less money, they can buy less education or they can buy no health if they are, let's say, here, all right? This person, obviously, with no money or zero money, there is very little that they can engage in terms of the economy. They cannot buy best technology. They cannot maybe even get the healthcare unless it's organized through the government or something like that. Like we see, for example, in some countries, you know, millions of people without health insurance. And then if they are out of economy, then totally they can't do anything. Now, what's, what happens in this society, we see that Based on your purchasing power then, and what's available in the economy, there are certain gaps in the economy. Certain people, for whatever reason, they can't engage economy more or less here and there. Okay, so we see certain gaps. And even sometimes, even if you have all of the money, maybe you can't get what you want. Let's say you can't get defense that you want in your country. All right, so you just don't have technology. You just don't have what you need. Even you are personally wealthy, but your country might not be uh, that strong. Okay. Now, one of the aims of Sharia is protection of the wealth, protection of economic system. And that's why we have so many rules, you know, uh, and these rules come under Muamalat in Islam. So, so the rules in Muamalat is that everything is permissible unless there is specific text to prohibit these transactions. So this is always rule that we keep in mind as opposite to acts of worship in, in Ibadat, which is that, you know, you just follow prescriptively what's been prescribed in Muamalat. We do whatever we can that makes sense unless we go against the objectives of the Sharia or against something that is explicitly prohibited. So in this economy, there are a couple of things we want to notice. As we have more and more on these institutions, engagement depends on, on the purchasing power that, by these participants. That's why Islam, for example, encourages the people as they get more and more wealthier, that they should distribute that wealth, make it circulate in society so that more and more people can engage. And therefore, economy will be better. It will work better for everybody. So we have, for example, a uh, couple of ways that Islam does these things. So these are just macro, I just want you to understand how this functions. So what are the, some of the ways that this works is, for example, let's say zakat. So zakat is, is, is a way to distribute partially some of this wealth and target spe specific people. Okay, so these people, for example, give their wealth to some of these categories in society. And thus, these people can then engage 
in institutions within that particular society. So a portion of the wealth goes to prescribed groups. Very, very powerful tool, very surgical, solves very important uh, uh, issues in society and fills certain gaps that are created. Then we have general sadaka, for example. General sadaka, you know, while zakat is on specific, uh, very specific in terms of who pays it and who receives it for which purpose, sadaka is more broader, more broader. So everybody can pay it. Everybody can participate in plugging the certain holes in this society and bringing the people. The next way is what we call, for example, institution of aukaf, wakuf, or endowment. These are for elites in society. These elites sometimes recognize that there are very big holes in society here and there. Okay? You cannot just plug them by, you know, giving charity to someone. Let's say you want a hospital, you want to have a research center, uh, or you want to uh, uh, have anything that is real edu education, for example. Some of the universities in our country, if you look, they were uh, created through endowments. For instance, in Turkey, uh, when I spoke with the head of Aukaf in Turkey, they have 20,000 Aukaf properties with 80,000 people working, and some of these Aukaf properties take care of stray cats and dogs. Okay, so we have this uh, enormous institution uh, that solely try to uh, solve big problems in society. So these things they target uh, through Wakuf, <coughs> they target big uh, challenges in our society. Now some of these institutions, they might even benefit the rich and other people and everybody else. L just like for example, if I had today uh, Aukaf, let's say I put endowment fund, $50 million, for example, uh, through, you know, maybe I buy, let's say I buy an com apartment block and I uh, rent that. And the profit from that, let's say the profit is, I don't know, 5%, 10%. Okay, and the profit from that I use to fund research on Islamophobia. Okay, or media organization that answers back attacks against Muslims. So I have, I have a property, let's say I, I, buy, I buy this property, which generates, okay, what's, what's the 10% um, of 50 million? That's, that's 5 million, isn't it? You know? So let's say it generates 3, 4 million. So 3, 4 million that it generates every year, I can employ, you know, 10, 20 people, professionals uh, in, in media, in research, in, in, uh, in uh, developing content that fights. And, and then that is in perpetuity. So I don't need to go anywhere. It's self-funding, and that is our, our, our cuff. You know, so, so these institutions could be educational, could be anything else. They, design, they, design, they are designed to plug in certain holes in society and solve big problems in society. After that, we could have, you know, even just the way Islam breaks the wealth, you know, the wealth in, through in the law of inheritance, makes the wealth broken down and circulate in society, by breaking it into the uh, into the genuine and 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 uh, and, uh, and uh, uh, engaging more and more people, uh, it forces the circulation of the money. And every other society, I don't want to go even you know if you look at takaful, uh, mutual uh, insurance, what they call it, um, and and any other institution. What Islam is trying to do is make money circulate, benefit more people, and through this it lifts. As they say, rising tide lifts whole boats. So we create a better, better society. Now somebody will say, but why Islam puts these prohibitions then? Well, these prohibitions in Islam are there to define this border. You see, this border of economy. The game in terms of economy, when they ask the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, what's the best way to make money? What's the best way to make gain? And he, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, told us, the best way to do it is you make something with your own hands, and then every legitimate sale. Why is that important? That is important because you want to have something valuable, tangible, whether it's agriculture, whether it's manufacturing, whether it's some genuine tangible service and so on. So you make money producing something that is real and then you sell it. And Islam then puts the border around these things to capture everything real economic from fictional uh, things like exploitation, 
you know, like gambling, like engaging in uh, interest-based transaction, all of these things that don't have direct link with the real economy. So Islam says don't focus on these fake transaction, fake economy, focus on the real things that are connecting capital owners, ideas, innovation, and people in a way that benefits society the most. And through this, once you engage in a risk and uh, you provide benefit, what you do? You sell that. Okay? So when we look, heart of this system then, okay? Because notice, a lot of people love this part until now. Because it's a distribution of the wealth, zakat giving, uh, sadaka giving, 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 and and we know Quran tells us, spend from the good things that you earn that we gave you. But where? How are you gonna earn these things? How are you gonna earn to be here or here or here so that you can give sadaka, zakat, uh, leave endowment? How are you gonna do that? What is at the heart of this system? Okay. At the heart of this system is entrepreneurship. It's a trade. That's why Quran tells us that uh, riba is prohibited and trade is allowed because the heart of the system of Islamic economic and any other system is the entrepreneurship. Simply doing something of value, as the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam told us, making something of value, making something with your own hand, something that is tangible, and then selling it. So this is the cycle of entrepreneurship that Islam wants to encourage in the economy. And anything that goes against these things falls under the prohibition and falls outside. So our, uh, our idea in this course is to define this border, okay? to, to learn about this border, to see what are the things we shouldn't be making money and what are the things we should be making money. How do we understand what is legitimate, what is not? And how do we understand what the leadership in this entrepreneurship? Because Islamic finance is entrepreneurial and trade-based finance. It comes with the business mindset of Abdurrahman ibn Nauf, who rejected to be from the lower hand people, that somebody take care of him, but rather he says, where is the market? And through doing this, he went to the market, engaged, he developed the skills, he found the solutions, he grew the confidence, create, we created the whole economy that solved all of our problems, able to take care of itself, and through growing, developing, we gained upper hand, and we were able to sustain and take on even bigger challenges. So this creates then situation where Islam become a lifestyle. Islam become a lifestyle. The people engage in health, education, in science, technology, defense, anything, politics, media, okay, uh, business. So Islam, we see circulation of everything in society. And through this growth, and through this, we see Islam being established as a lifestyle with the people who are best amongst us, benefiting the highest number of people.